Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is chapter 13. Uh, we've been working our way through uh, a unit on uh, sampling techniques and simulations, ways that we get good unbiased data. In this chapter, chapter 13, we're going to be talking about how to conduct a, a good statistically relevant experiment and the differences between experiments and observational studies. Uh, mostly this is about experiments, right? Uh, observational studies, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about those. So we're actually going to start with that. Um, about what an observational study is. So uh, an observational study, uh, researchers don't assign choices, they just observe them. Okay, so what we're talking about here is a situation where we want to gather some data. Uh, and it can be about whatever uh, particular situation uh, you want to choose. Uh, the text example uh, is looking at the relationship between music education and grades. Basically saying that uh, those people, uh, those kids, who uh, are deeply ingrained in music education uh, tend to have higher grades, okay? So they wanted to test, we wanna test that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some kids at a young age and we're going to see uh, what their grades are at, at a later age. So we're gonna go to a music education program for kids and then we're going to uh, follow those kids over the course of time and see how their grades compare to some st a group of students who are not in there. And notice that this is an observational study because the researchers aren't assigning a choice. They're not telling us that uh, they're not going to take a group of kids and then split them into two groups and say, okay, this group, you go and do music and you don't do music. They're not doing that. They're, they're finding some kids who are in music and they're looking at them in the wild, right? They're observing them in the wild. Uh, this makes it an observational study, okay? If an if an experimenter or a researcher is simply observing the situation, they, it, then it is an observational study. If they're not assigning choices, if the researchers aren't intervening and telling the participants uh, what they need to do, then it is an observational study. All right. Um, the there's two types of observational studies uh in the this example the the uh, the subjects were identified who studied music and then they collected the data on their past grades that makes it a retrospective study uh, there's also a prospective study saying that if they had identified subjects in advance and then collected data as they went through the years we would call that a prospective study so there's a retrospective observational study which is when they take uh, things that have already happened and they just observe and look at the data from something that's already happened. And then there's prospective studies, which uh, we pick some people and then we observe them over the course of time. Uh, observational studies are valuable. They help us discover trends and possible relationships. However, observational studies, no matter what they are, do not demonstrate a causal relationship, meaning we cannot determine cause and effect simply by looking at an observational study. To take the uh, example of music education uh, example, we cannot determine if being in music e education causes good grades. We know that there's a correlation between them, uh, but that doesn't mean that, that it causes it because there's lots of other variables that could be involved. Uh, people who are in music education tend to have more money, uh, at least they who put their kids in music education as a young child. Uh, if you have more money, that may have a, another relationship with a person's grades. So notice how there's two different things there that could be causing high grades. Is it the music education, or is it the fact that people who have enough money to put their kids in music education uh, will have them have good grades. Or it could just be that uh, families who believe that music education is important for a kid are going to put them into music education, but just being a part of the family that cares like that might also be causing that child to have higher grades, right? There's, there's a lot of different variables at work here that might be causing the good grades. So an observational study doesn't help us determine that cause and effect. It shows a relationship is there, 
but it doesn't show a cause and effect relationship. So observational studies are limited in what they can do. What we really want to be able to do is talk about a randomized comparative experiment. Now, the, ex the purpose of an experiment is to create a design that allows us to prove that cause and effect relationship. The idea of an experiment is that we are going to take a couple of explanatory variables, things we call factors, uh, we're going to manipulate them uh, to show us at least one of the response variables. The idea being that we can control other variables so that we can see if the variable we chose is the one having an effect. Okay, So experiments manipulate these factors to create these things called treatments. They randomly assign subjects to these treatments. And then they compare the responses uh, of those subjects across treatment levels. So we, we create these factors uh, of things that, of, a, of a variable that we think is going to have an effect. We randomly assign people to have that. And then we compare them uh, at the end. And if we've controlled the variables appropriately, then we might be able to see if uh, the, there is a cause and effect relationship between this variable. Okay? Uh, so he, here's some other uh, vocabulary that we need to talk about here. Um, oh, sorry, uh, we got to talk about this first. Uh, in an experiment, the experimenter actively and deliberately manipulates the factors to control the details of po the possible treatments, uh, assigns to those treatments at random. Uh, and then we compare at the end. Uh, we, we kind of already said this. Basically, uh, the idea is that we are, we are controlling the variables such that we, can, uh, we have a legitimate comparison. Okay? Uh, when we are working with individuals uh, in the experiment, we call these things experimental units. Uh, you might hear them called subjects or participants if we're talking about humans. Um, the specific values that an experimenter chooses for a factor are called the levels of the factor. Um, and uh, once we have all of the levels decided, we call that a treatment. So let me give you an example of uh, what we could be talking about with levels. L let's say we wanted to test uh, a, a waterproofing treatment. Okay, We want to test a waterproofing uh, uh, a waterproofing liquid. Sorry, here let's not use the word treatment. Okay, uh, I might take a piece of a piece of leather. Okay, and on that piece of leather or various pieces of leather, um, I might do a full dose of the waterproofing. I'm just going to do that WP. I might do a half dose of the W the waterproofing. And I might do no dose of the waterproofing. And what that's, this is going to be three different levels of my factor. So the factor is the waterproofing liquid, right? Does applying this waterproofing liquid to leather prevent wear and tear? I have three levels of that a full dose of the waterproofing, a half dose, and a no dose. And then what I'm going to do at the end is compare them. And uh, we'll be comparing the wear and tear in a leather. Like maybe I'll uh, leave them out in the rain for six weeks or something like that. And uh, at the end, I'll compare it. Does the full dose leather have more wear and tear or less wear and tear than the no dose? If these two treatments look the same, then there's some proof here that the waterproofing really isn't doing much. Okay, so this is sort of an idea of what we're talking about with treatments and levels. Uh, the treatment is the waterproofing liquid, and I've got three different levels of that waterproofing liquid. And at the end, I'm going to compare those three different levels. And if I controlled my variables properly, uh, I can look at the results of that and determine whether that the waterproofing liquid is doing its job. Okay, um, so. Uh, the like I said here, the treatment is a combination of those levels, right? So I had the full dose treatment, I had the half dose treatment, and I had the no dose treatment. I had three treatments uh, for that variable. 
When we're talking about creating an experiment, there are four main principles that we need to be talking about. The first is control. Uh, we need to control sources of variation other than the factors we are testing by making conditions as similar as possible for all treatment groups. Let's say that I wanted to grow some vegetables, right? And I've got my four vegetable plots out here. Uh, and I want to know if uh, my particular brand of fertilizer is going to have an effect on uh, how my vegetables grow. Uh, I might choose f a couple of different beds um, and within those beds split them up to various levels of the, um, of the fertilizer. So I might do no fertilizer, I might do a half dose of fertilizer, and I might do a full dose of fertilizer. Well, we've got to be careful when we're setting up a design, right? So it, the way that we set up these boxes is going to matter. I, I have lots of other variables that influence growth of a plant, right? Where the sun is can, can influence that. So we need to make sure that all of my planter boxes are getting equal amounts of sun. Water, how much water a plant gets can, cr can talk about its growth also. I need to control so the amount of water each plant gets so that they're all getting the exact same amount. So there's other sources of variation that we have to control so that the only factor that's making a difference is the fertilizer. Okay, so main principle, biggest principle of experimental design is to make sure that we are controlling sources of variation. Next, we need randomization. Okay, randomization allows us to equalize the effects of unknown or uncontrollable sources of variation. Uh, in the plant example, uh, it could be that where I buy the plants makes a difference, right? I should try to buy all of the uh, plants from the exact same store, uh, but there's going to be variations within those plants. I need to randomly assign them to plots so that the sources of variation in buying different plants get equally distributed to the different treatments. Okay? That randomization helps eliminate some of these sources of variation that we can't control. It spreads them out across the treatment levels so that they're not unduly influencing one of them. If you don't have randomization, you don't have a valid experiment. Um, and all of the inference methods that we're going to do at the end of this course, they don't work. Randomization is imperative. And as we have talked about in our other videos in this chapter, humans are bad at randomness. We can't choose those things appropriately, so we need to deliberately use randomization so that we don't put our bias into it. Okay, so randomization, essential part of experimental design. Uh, find, we have replication. Replication means two things. Uh, we first need to repeat the experiment applying treatments to a number of subjects. If I have these fertilizers that I'm testing, right, full dose, half dose, no dose, I need to make sure that I have multiple plants getting full dose, multiple plants getting half dose, multiple plants getting no dose. One of each is not data, it's called an anecdote, right? Or it's anecdotal evidence, and that's bad, right? We need replication. We need every treatment group to have several plants in it so that we can make sure that they're all getting the same benefit from this treatment. Okay, so that's one of the things that replication means. The other thing that replication means is that we need to, uh, we need to be able to repeat an experiment uh, with controlled sources of variation. So uh, if I truly wanted to know if my fertilizer was having an effect, I would want to be able to repeat this experiment several times, right, with lots of different digging plots. Uh, so that we're replicating the results of that. And that is an essential step in science. Doing a single experiment doesn't necessarily prove that cause and effect relationship. We need to have repeatable or replicatable results. So replication, a pillar of experimental design. Finally, our last one, blocking. This is not necessarily needed. 
depends on the experiment, but it, it is an important one for the ones that do it. So sometimes attributes of experimental units that we are studying uh, that we can't control may nevertheless affect the outcomes of the experiment. So what we do is we group the similar individuals together into blocks and then we do the treatments for them. So an example of that would be like in a drug trial, they often block by males and females first. So we take a group of males and we take a group of females. Uh, so we're separating our participants in the beginning because male bodies can will oftentimes react differently to a drug than female bodies will and so you have blocking by gender first and then you do the two factors drug no drug and you do the drug no drug oops uh, for both groups and then you compare these okay uh, you do this blocking step because there may be differences between our two groups of individuals and if we lumped them together it could be that one group has more males than females which may change the the overall results because one group in one treatment might have more males which is influencing the results so blocking uh, is something that we do in some cases where we know the participants have uh, certain features that might do it. So it's a compromise between randomization and control. Uh, it is not required in experimental design, but oftentimes it is. You need to look at your particular experiment and decide, is this a case where my experimental units should be blocked beforehand because of some feature that the, the participants may have? Okay. So those are our four big principles of experimental design. If we can follow those things, we'll be good. Uh, what we have here is a, a diagram. Often once we've kind of figured out what we're going to do with the experiment, we diagram it out. You may have seen me doing this in the previous slides. Um, all this really does is it gives us a visual picture of how we are separating the treatments. So we will randomly allocate our participants to two groups. Group one gets treatment one, group two gets treatment two, and then I compare the two groups, okay? This is a very simple example of an experiment. We have two treatments, group one gets the first, group two gets the second, and then we compare them. So oftentimes in order to organize our experiments, we want to, we want to diagram them first, okay? Uh, finally, when we're doing the comparison, we're looking at differences between the two treatments. Uh, when differences are larger than what we would expect to get from randomization, we call this statistically significant. This is a big word. It's got a lot of meaning that we're not necessarily going to go into depth here uh, because it's going to be a huge part of what we do in inference. So for now, just think about um, if the differences are so large that we know that those differences couldn't have come from randomization, like there's actually something between the treatments that are causing the difference, uh, then we call it statistically significant. And we will, I promise, in the future chapters, 18 through 24, we'll talk really deeply about what statistically significant means, but this is just kind of a general overview. The differences are big enough that it couldn't have been randomization. All right, that's everything we've got for this particular video. Uh, in the next video, we're going to do a full example um, of an experiment. We're going to talk about the different uh, variety of uh, thought processes that we have when we conduct the experiment. We're going to do a full diagram. We're going to talk about uh, how we distribute things randomly. So we're going to do all of those things in the very next video. So I hope to see you then. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.